welcome to Your Need to Know. I'm your host, Katherine Reed, and joining me today is Delegate Jennifer Boisco from House District 86 here in Northern Virginia. Welcome, Delegate Boisco. Well, thank you so much, Catherine. It's happy. I'm really happy to be here. So what we want to talk about today is sort of the upcoming elections. We have mm -hmm. 100 House of Delegate races, and we hope to really change those seats, change the faces that we see in our legislature. Um, you were one of those groundbreaking elections. And let's talk a little bit about how when you ran in 2013, you came very close to beating an incumbent. I did. I ran a grassroots um, driven campaign uh, with donations in the 50 to $100 range, um, came 32 votes short of beating a 12 year incumbent who had been the mayor of my town for 20 years before that. So it was really a shock to everyone when I got into the race. People basically patted me on the head and said, oh, aren't you cute for trying this? And then um, now, as you see, I, I ran again in 2015 and I'm now serving as the House Caucus Finance Chair for the Democrats this year. And so you really are, you have a, you've blazed a trail in many ways for women Mm -hmm. who have run previously and who get very discouraged. Some women have run once, some have run twice, and it's very difficult to get elected, which is why we yeah. have so few women sitting in our General Assembly. It is. In fact, this year out of the 100 members, only 16 of us are coming back, and that's Democrats and Republicans. But we are blessed this year with a whole huge group of women candidates. I believe we've got over 50 on the ballot this year. Really unprecedented. We've got 88 Democrats running, again, unprecedented in recent years because we believe we've got a fabulous chance of picking up a lot of seats in the House of Delegates. There are 34 Democrats right now, and that's just enough to hold the governor's vetoes, which I'm very grateful because we were able to stop a lot of heinous legislation last year and the year before that. But we need 17 more seats, and um, there's just one fact that I've got to share with you. In last year's election in 2016, there were 17 seats, uh, districts that were are currently held by Republicans that Hillary Clinton won. So, if we are to have a wave election by chance, if we were to raise the Democratic performance by say five percent, we would be able to take over. The House of Delegates. Now that's a really big lift. It is. And it is. Uh, you know, I think we've got to really look at this in a you know a multi-year path. But it is possible if we were to do everything perfectly and all of our candidates did everything that they need to do. You know, there's a lot of hard work that goes into running a campaign, though, and you know, knocking on the doors, talking to voters, making sure that you're talking to the right people. That's. That's what everybody's out there doing right now. You know, all of us are, are pounding Ab the pavement. Absolutely, and it is. There's, you're right, there's a lot of moving parts. Part of it is raising money, which is actually one of the hurdles that a lot of candidates mm -hmm. have trouble overcoming, particularly women. Yes. You know, and it's very difficult. Women can make 100 phone calls, and men can make 100 phone calls, and the amount of money each of them raises is dramatically different. And I am a perfect example of that. I, I um, in 2013 specifically, but even in 2015, I would spend seven hours on the day, on a day, every day, calling through voters. I would talk to, I mean, to, to donors, um, so that I could make maybe 10 people who would tell me they would give me $100 to raise $1,000 a day. Now, that's probably not what most gentlemen end up doing, but I believe that I would, you know, do whatever I needed to do. In fact, in the spring, I skipped a family vacation so that I could stay home and raise money um, because I just believe that it's so important that we have the resources for all of our candidates. I, in turn, am now the finance chair for the House Democratic Caucus. And so, as a member of the leadership, I am able to raise bigger dollars from folks and leverage that. There are groups of donors in Virginia that have gotten together and created a group called Win Virginia, making sizable um, uh, investments in, in our efforts. And along with that, in order to win Virginia, you've got to run everywhere. I've created a leadership pack that is raising into the, the House Democratic Caucus so that I can provide as many resources as possible. So let's talk a little bit about PACs for people who don't give money or mm -hmm. have not given money previously. And by the way, I'm going to cite something that Julie Jacopic talked about at the Women's Summit that was held in June in Leesburg. Julie Jagopic was asking the women, primarily mm -hmm. women in the audience, to guess what percentage of funds raised come from women. And the shocking number is 
percent. Isn't that something? So women are not writing checks, and there's a lot of reasons why. I mean, there's a lot of women, there's, number one, we don't make the same pay as men. Could that be it? There's a lot of households that are headed by single women. Mm -hmm. I used to be one, mm -hmm. which means that you, you don't, don't see, have that. you don't have the cash. But even for people who do have the cash, clearly women are not donating in sizable, substantive sums. And I think we need to look at how it's different to donate directly to a candidate mm -hmm. who called you on the phone like you did, mm -hmm. and giving to a PAC. Why would people give to a PAC? Well, usually the PACs vet their candidates a little more carefully, so they're watching on how many doors the candidate is knocking, what their return rate is as far as getting support, um, other kinds of work that they're doing to make sure that they've got a strong and viable a viable uh, campaign running. And, and my few dollars and your few dollars and our friends' few dollars ends up making a lot of money, so then your impact can be greater. Um, there's, you, you're familiar with the uh, Virginia's list, which right. is based after Emily's list, early money is like yeast. Absolutely. The same thing in Virginia, and you're on the board of that, aren't you? I'm on the board not? of Virginia's list, and one of the things that we grapple with, like every PAC does, is that you've got, let's say, 50 women running. Mm -hmm. Not all 50 women have the same chance. All right. of them are trying to raise money. All of them need mm -hmm. money to, in order to win. Mm -hmm. But the fact of the matter is, people want to make an investment where you know that the ROI, your, the return on your investment, is likely to result in a win. Right. So, so there's a lot of factors besides we really like this candidate in this particular district. But that district is reliably red. And even though we appreciate having that candidate running there and we want to support that candidate mm -hmm. and her and, and the local community needs to support that candidate, what the PACs are doing is where do we have an opportunity realistically to pick up another seat. Right. So like for instance, here in Northern Virginia, we've got two open seats. That's usually your best chance of a pickup. Same thing happened when I was running in 2015. Um, so the 42nd district, which was held by Dave Albo, who was very, very popular and very, very liked so. on both sides of the aisle, he's decided to retire. And so now Kathy Tran is our, is our nominee for the Democrats. We feel like she's got a very strong chance of picking that seat up. In district, House District 2, um, the same thing. Duden Heffer has decided to retire, and um, we expect that we should have a very strong chance to pick that seat up as well. So again, there's a lot of balls in the air with all of these races. Um, people's commitment to the community, their past work in the community, if they've been really a big part of it, that's a good sign that tells you that perhaps they would have a better chance than somebody who just woke up and said, I'm ready to serve the the world now, right, right. who had never, you know, even joined the PTA been engaged, or has not been, engaged been on in the their community. chamber or anything. Right. And so we've got, in, in looking at tr trying to change the faces that we see in our General Assembly, mm -hmm. Kathy Tran, who is running in District 42, would be the first Asian American woman, woman. Mm -hmm. elected Correct. to our state legislature. Yes. Um, Liz Gu Liz Elizabeth Guzman, Guzman would be the first Latina. Yes. Um, and Danica Rome. Danica Rome in HD 13 would be the first trans woman elected to our state legislature. But the thing is, and we'll use Danica as an example of someone who is running on the issue her district cares about, which is yes. Route 28, the traffic yes. on Route 28. So for her, it's not a matter of vote for me because of my gender. It's a matter Correct. of vote for me because I've lived in Manassas my entire life. She is a she is a journalist. Mm -hmm. She has reported these issues. She Knows has them inside and out. She has the deep relationship. She is a credible candidate mm -hmm. talking to the issues her district cares about because she's listened to the district. And that's what we need. And we have candidates like that all over Virginia. In um, Down in Southwest Virginia, we've got a, a candidate who um, has also served in on uh, as a reporter, the anchor of the news, Chris, Chris Hurst. Hurst. And you know, he knows his community inside and out. He, he, he was a victim of that horrible um, shooting. The shooting. His, his fiance, his was, fiance shot was killed. Mm -hmm. But that's not what he's running on either. Right. He has an interesting story that gets attention, but then he knows his stuff from education to economic development to transportation. We are not fielding um, one issue right. candidates. And we're not fielding unknowns either. These right. people who are running on some level are known in their community. That's correct. And they're strong, smart, wonderful people who represent what Virginia looks like. So we, in the Democratic Party, we have people of all backgrounds. We have more women. We have uh, LGBT candidates. We've got folks from different um, ethnic 
uh, groups. It's really exciting to see that we're really working on creating more diversity because in the General Assembly, when we are debating issues, if nobody has a personal context for something that's affecting right. a large group of minorities, then it's not really taken seriously. But if someone can stand up and say, well, let me explain to you why this action really matters, then you get the uh, the attention and the ear of the entire I think chamber. That, I think that's so true. It's when you talk about diversity. To me, it's a di it's diversity of thought, mm -hmm. experience. Yes, you know, and and people have bring a different lived experience. Women bring a different lived experience. Right. You know, some of the things that I believe where we have not been able to get regulated child care in this state. You know, nobody's talking about paid leave in this state. You know, because it doesn't affect the members of that assembly, mm -hmm. many of whom have been there for 10, 20, 30 years. Right. Right? That's not their issue. Doesn't touch them. You know, that's not, you know, no, oftentimes you, 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 you hear, I'm not hearing that from my constituents. But the fact of the matter is, constituents also have to understand there's, there's two ways you make change where you live. You get involved in advocacy, mm -hmm. and you get out and you vote every yes. single year. Yeah. That's something that I want to talk about, because in, the, in a presidential year and in our statewides, Democrats typically win in Virginia. You know, Hillary Clinton won her election in 2016 the only here Southern in Virginia, state. The, the only, only Southern, Southern state. state. We, um, we have elected both of our states, our, our U.S. senators are Democrats. We have now, you know, Terry McAuliffe was elected strongly, and I believe that Ralph Northam will also be elected, as well as our, uh, our Lieutenant Governor Justin Fairfax. He's our Democratic candidate, and, and the wonderful Mark Herring, our current Attorney General, I believe he will be going back. But in the, in the state races, for some reason, people don't give that as much value at the, at the polls. They don't realize the influence and the impact that what we do really matters on their day-to-day -day lives. And so it's been my, my mission this year as the finance chair to, to have conversations with people not only here in Virginia, but around the nation, about what is at stake. For instance, we, there's only one state left needed to do the Constitutional Convention, only one state left in the country. In, if we look nationwide at state legislatures, the Republicans have put an enormous effort in to flip mm -hmm to uh, red uh, leading districts they all over. And they've done that we've by lost. building a by building a bench yep. over the long term and, and via gerrymandering. Yes. And when we come back from our break, that's exactly what I want to talk about. Okay. Are all of the factors that are actually affecting why it's so difficult to flip these seats. A lot of it has to do with those gerrymandered mm -hmm. districts, and a lot of it has to do with the fact that people don't even know who represents them. And yeah. we're going to talk after the break about that. You know what, guys? There's a lot of tree branches and dry brush over here. We should probably move the bonfire over there. I'm guessing Smokey liked that idea. Hey, did you know 2.4 million loving cats and dogs in shelters and rescues need our help to find a home? Let's go to the shelterpetproject.org and meet a few who are in a shelter near you. Harlo. Oh, she's one great listener who loves to hear all your stories. My kind of cat. Cerulo is a sweet, goofy boy who's eager to please. Sounds just like another dog I know. So go to the shelterpetproject.org, search your local shelters and rescues, and go for a cuddle with your next best friend. Adopt. Welcome back to Your Need to Know. I'm your host, Katherine Reed. Today I'm talking with Delegate Jennifer Boisco, and we are talking about the changing face of our General Assembly and the opportunity we have this year 
to change who sits in those seats. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Catherine. As, I, as we were talking before the, the, the break, we were talking about the fact that Republicans have taken so many seats around the country. In fact, since the Tea Party was, you know, really took hold, uh, Democrats have lost 900 seats in state legislatures around the nation. A lot of that has to do with gerrymandering and a strategy that the Republicans have specifically have placed in order to really um, make this a priority for them. We need to take that back. I sit on the Privileges and Elections Committee in the House of Delegates and I will tell you the shenanigans were I was there in the committee vote. So much legislation gets killed in committee in that committee. never gets to a floor yep. vote. That you know the votes were not recorded in committee, although people were there with their devices, yep. live streaming it, yes. taking photos of of how that committee mm -hmm. voted. I think there's going to be more of that this session too, of holding representatives accountable for how they're voting in those committees. I you know. I agree with you completely. It's so frustrating when they just call a voice vote to put a table, you know, table a bill, which means they're killing it, and then they don't have to take responsibility for it later. Um, that's something that I've been working on trying to in increase the visibility. Absolutely, because this is the thing: voting records matter. But, but let's go. Let's roll this back to the average person on the street. If you said, "Who is your delegate? Who is your state senator?" Mm -hmm. would probably go. I don't know, ah, right? Right. So VPAP.org, mm -hmm. which is Virginia Public Access Project, which is a nonprofit here in Virginia that collects yes. every bit of information about candidates, about donors, about districts, and anybody can go there for free and type their address in. It's right on the home page. Type your address in, and it will tell you who your congressman is, mm -hmm. who your state senator is, and who your delegate is. And I think we need to start there. I think you're right, and you can also look up somebody's voting record. So you, at least you can see what the final votes were and what their legislation they sponsored uh, was, and which will give you a little bit more idea about what somebody stands for, which I think we really need to be paying more attention to. Because as I said earlier, our, our bread and butter issues, things that we care about at our kitchen table are decided about economic development, about what policies our schools hold, about how much money our social services are able to provide to the most vulnerable people, whether or not we expand Medicaid and have health care for folks. I mean, these are some really serious issues, as well as transportation, of course, which all of us are concerned about, right? Absolutely. And the thing is, in order for you to have an impact on legislators, you know, when people put out a call and say, you need to call or email, which mm -hmm. a lot of us are doing right now at the federal level, yes. call and email about health care. Mm -hmm. The fact of the matter is, you first of all, if you don't know who your delegate or senator is, you, you don't, don't even, even know if you're a call. constituent. constituent. Uh -huh. But they care about constituent calls. So somebody Absolutely. outside your district, like I'm outside your district, mm -hmm. I can call and email you and say, Jennifer, I want this changed, or I want you to vote this way on this bill. But your first thought is, well, is this a voter? I mean, is this somebody I represent in my district? So constituents need to know who their representatives they do. are. That's Absolutely. where the power is. And it makes a big difference to hear from constituents. I heard more from my constituents during the session about the redistricting than any other issue. That's something that I already care a lot about, but I especially want to make sure that I'm keeping them informed on what's going on, and I'm more likely to get more involved because that is something that my community cares a lot about. And let's talk about the fact that you know people don't think their one vote phone call yeah, or their yes. one email or visiting your office matters, but actually it's it something does. you can point to to mm -hmm. say, I have a mandate from my constituents. Yes. In fact, I've heard from 500 people about this bill or about yes. this issue. Mm -hmm. And that gives you leverage when you stand it up does. to say, I have heard from the people I represent. I know what they care about. And that does make a big difference, for sure. And I think after what happened, you know, there's a lot of people who are newly engaged, mm -hmm. lots of people. I welcome them. It's kind of like, too. thank you, thank you for being here. But they also need are trying to figure out how to do this. And part of it is elections, but part of it is understanding how you get people elected. Yes, you donate to those people. You phone bank for those people. Mm -hmm. You make phone calls for those people. Important, more importantly, probably, you need to give those, those candidates context mm -hmm. in your personal network. Mm -hmm. Like there's my, a lot of people who may not ever meet Jennifer Boisco. But when I talk about Jennifer Boisco, all the people who know, trust, and like me are like, my gosh, Jennifer Boisco, she must be somebody, because Catherine's like all about her. <laughs> and I think people don't understand their, their personal power to influence people who are not as engaged as they, they are to give candidates a context. That's so true. So there's been a lot of study about how, how you persuade someone about a, a candidate. 
of course, the most, the most powerful is the candidate going and speaking to you directly, which is what I spend my time on every afternoon, and all of our candidates should be doing that. But secondly, it's someone who knows me going to speak to other people, which is exactly what you were just referring to. Absolutely. You going and talking to your friends who may not be engaged or interested or, or have them, you know, some people are working three jobs, let's just be honest, that, you know, they're just trying to get food on their table and they don't have time to spend hours going through websites and stuff. But if they know you and you say, Jennifer's a good person, she cares about the things you care about, then they're more likely to come out and vote. So those are the things that really do matter. It's that person-to-person -person connection and, and, and the ability to listen and to make sure that you understand what someone else's concerns are. I think that's, you know, I think so with Ralph Northam, and we had a very competitive primary, yes. in fact, the benefit of that very competitive primary was that the Democrats turned out in a record number for a primary Record year. number. 520,000. Mm -hmm. I mean, 200,000 more than came out in 2009 when we had a three-way primary. Yes. That says something about the engagement of Democrats. And I can understand why, you know, as the finance chair of the caucus, you're going, this is so doable. Like, the, 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 the planets are aligning mm -hmm. so much that we could do this, but we need people to engage to Correct. take us to that finish line. Those 17 districts where Hillary won, you people need to come back. Exactly. You know, if you fought, if you were out and voting in the presidential election, you should. It's your responsibility to come out and, and vote again because we really are looking for a very small number of increased turnout that could make the difference between winning and losing. And as somebody who's lost by 32 votes, right. I am always mining for people to, to say, you really do matter. We had a, we had a, a one of the primaries in one of the House races, House District 2, was decided by 12 votes. Yeah, Tina, Tina Foy, wasn't it? Jennifer Carol Foy. Jennifer and, Carol Foy, yes. And Josh, yes. Yes, and it, was, and it came down to 12 mm -hmm. votes. And you know, and that, for the 12 people that came out for her, right, yes. it made all of the difference. It did, and so um, whenever somebody says it doesn't matter, so if you're not gonna be around for election day, you can vote early at your, uh, off-site polling place, which if you go to the, the, the State Board of Elections website, you can get that information depending yes. on where you live. Yes, that's right. Or you can mail in an absentee ballot um, to, to, to mail it back in. Those really matter. They, it, it makes a big difference between winning and losing. And so think of your college-age students, your, your kids who might be, you know, traveling for for work or yourself. If you have to go out of your county and then back in, that's reason to vote. If you're taking care of an elderly family member or a young family member, that's another reason to vote. There are a number of reasons that a person can vote um, early absentee or purely absentee by mail. Right. And we want to make sure that everybody knows that their vote matters. And if they can't get to the polls on election day, please make sure to, to make that happen beforehand. And I'm hoping too that our young people will stay engaged. You know, yes. Tom Perriello really ran mm -hmm. to engage young people and they were engaged. Yeah. But we need them co to continue to be engaged. And yes, they will all be back to college on November 7th. And so this is one way, if young people really want to have a voice, yeah. their vote is their voice. That's right. And they can vote in their home district by absentee ballot. Absolutely. In advance before, you know, when they're home on the weekend, mm -hmm. they can go on a Saturday and vote ahead of time. And I really hope that young people who are like, we want change, we want change. Well, you have this to This is be, the change. You have to be the change. You have to be part of it. Yeah. Yeah. And we, we see such a drop off, a, a cataclysmic drop off after presidential years. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and we are one of the few states that has an off year election. New Jersey's the other one. The only other in the entire nation. Country, I know. And, and I think a lot of people are not, that's not on their radar are even if they're native Virginians. Mm -hmm. The other thing is that we're the only state left with a one-term governor. In the entire nation. In the entire nation. Mm -hmm. Again, I don't know what they teach in civics. I don't know what they teach in government class. Or maybe people just like don't retain it past the SOL that they have to take. But clearly Virginians are not understanding how we are different and the things yeah. that impact our ability to elect representatives who truly represent the people who live here. And that's one thing that I want to focus on too, is that in Virginia, I believe really that one of the most very powerful people is the Speaker of the House. The Speaker of the House decides every single person's committee assignments. So he decides, you know, if where they're going to be. Secondly, he decides where every single bill is going to go into which committee. And, and so he alone has the authority to make up 
really the future of what happens with our legislation. He stacks the deck. He stacks the deck. He stacks the deck with and both assignments. And it's perfectly fair and, you know, whoever is in the majority has that authority to do that. But if we could move towards taking uh, the lead in the House and getting the Democrats in majority, then we would be able to have go on the offense and do things like equal pay for equal work, for you know looking at the minimum wage and increasing that, making sure that our school public school system is as strong as possible, making sure that our most vulnerable do have resources that they need, making sure that health care is something that's accessible, making sure that women have the right to make choices about their own personal bodies and people who love one another are not going to be discriminated against. I want to make sure that you understand that, that this is something that is realistic in, in, in moving forward and taking a big seat. If we look at all of the different special elections around the country, most of those were in deep red districts. Do you have any idea what the Democratic performance increase was over oh, a regular? Oh, like John Ossoff, people were like, oh, we lost, we lost. But by a smaller margin than, yeah. than we, you know, the Republicans should have taken that seat. Right. It's reliably red, and we that, became very close. That's right. That was Newt Gingrich's seat. Yes. So we're looking at increases between 7 and 20 percent in Democratic performances in all of these different districts around the state, in, in Kansas, in Missouri, in Georgia. We don't need a 20 percent increase. We need 5 percent right. increase to really make a play and, for And people need big, not to be discouraged. Right. So we, there's, there's this one axiom that is so true, and it was the president of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation who said in an interview, we overestimate what we can do in one year, mm -hmm. and we underestimate what we can do in 10. Yes. And that's what I'm looking at. That's it's kind of like we keep saying, but we lost this race, and we lost this race, but we are slowly chipping away at it. We one are. One seat, two seats at mm -hmm. a time. And we need to be focused on the fact that it takes persistent, relentless oh, efforts. It Every really time. does. It does. You know, you can go back to my story. I was I was ridiculed for running against an incumbent. I almost beat him without really having the resources. I wasn't a targeted race. I came back, and when I won, um, Delegate John Bell and I both were new members. We brought the veto-proof minority to reality. It was our two elections that brought you to that, that brought us to be able to sustain 34. the governor's veto with 34 Democrats. We can do this. We, you know, we just have to be persistent. We have to be disciplined. We have to be focused, and we have to believe that we can. And that's that's. And I'm, that, I'm the biggest cheerleader we've got for that. I and you are an example. Can. You have lived it. I've lived it. Talk about lived experience. Yep. We need more people with different lived experience. Exactly. Thank you so much for being Thank here. Thank you so much I for so having me, I so appreciate you being here. And this is what, especially in 2017, you need to know.